then today, our second lecture, it's going to be about lung transplantation. Uh, this lecture is going to be presented by Dr. Islam Hamad. He's an assistant lecturer, anesthesia department, Ain Shams University Hospital, Egypt. He has also done a visiting scholarship in anesthesia of heart and lung transplant, Ohio State University. Uh, I'll leave the talk to you, Dr. Islam. Are you still here? Uh, thank you, Monique, for just a fruitful lecture. Um, it's my honor to be here among the scientific committee of the MEGA online course. Um, this is my uh, degree in university in Egypt, Ayn Shams University. I have no conflict of interest, so I can start right now. Uh, our dear audience, it's about 45 minutes, so please hold your, <laughs> hold your seatbelt and bring your coffee. Yeah, that's all. Uh, this is a nice framework. Uh, I wasn't interested in the cardiac anesthesia or even lung transplant. Uh, this is a nice framework how to make a change in your career and, or generally in your life. To make a change, you should have a vision, skills, incentives, resources, and action plan. If you have no vision, you get confused. If you have no skills, you get anxious. If there is no incentives, you will suffer from resistance. If in, as in some developing countries, if there are no resources, you will get frustrated. Finally, if you then it is going to be a false start. About lung transplant, this is the story of the lung transplant, which just started in the middle of the last century. Uh, at 1990, uh, they started the Living Global. This is a, a very important date for us in Egypt because I hope we will start our uh, program for lung transplant at 2021 uh, by donation of the Living Global. One of the most important uh, or two most important steps in the uh, story of lung transplant is the ex vivo lung perfusion and the donation uh, after cardiac death. This, these two steps uh, cause expansion of the uh, donor lung, so more and more lungs are available. Ex vivo lung perfusion is invented by Dr. Steen. Um, he invented uh, this uh, uh, enhancing and assessment of the marginal lung. I mean uh, marginal lung, which is uh, not uh, the young healthy. So you can uh, transplant a smoker lung after enhancing it. And the donation of cardiac death for sure uh, expand the pool uh, of donor lung. So uh, after becoming the single lung transplantation is the dominant, we can transplant double lung. And this is the trend right now, double lung transplant. Uh, when you pick a lung, you have about six hours to avoid the ischemia induced dysfunction. Uh, so they use the helicopter to transport this uh, organ. And at the hospital, uh, they, if the lung is marginal or borderline, they uh, get it into the lab to start the ex vivo lung perfusion. So what is the ex vivo lung perfusion? It's about the game changer of lung transplant because as we said, you can uh, transplant a smoker lung. Uh, so more and more lungs are, uh, became uh, available. This is, uh, this is here. This is the lung in this dome. You ventilate it with a lung protective strategy and you can perfuse it with, with, uh, with what's called the steam fluid. Steam fluid is the fluid invented by Dr. Steen at 2000. Uh, it's like the preferred cardiothesia for enhancing and decreasing the interstitial edema of the lung so it can improve it. This is the content of the steam fluid, and this is a very nice uh, video from the XV lab. As we can see, this is the ventilator. This is the lung inside the dome. For sure, it's the easiest uh, way for intubation. As we can see, this is the cannula in the pulmonary vein and the pulmonary artery, as we see here. And this is a leukocyte filter to uh, decrease the burden or the load of the leukocyte. So 
So they've been trained along with one protective strategy, push the same fluid, some missile prednisolone, sub to decrease the, uh, to decrease the interstitial edema, so they more or less can improve uh, this lung. And after four to five hours, they get the decision or can make the decision if this lung is uh, good for transplantation or more. So this is a very important stage or a very important uh, important step in the story of the lung transplant. Surgery, this is Dr. Brian Wesselman of the, uh, the most outstanding surgeons in Ohio State University. I can't remember this Saturday when, he, when we started the list with spotted cabbage, then uh, after doing heart transplant and at the midnight there was a single lung transplant. Single uh, and double lung transplant. Single lung transplant, the incision is simple thoracotomy. It's, uh, as we said, after availability of the lung, it's only about 25 of cases. We use what's called one lung ventilation, and ECMO is not our daily routine. The bilateral or double lung transplant, the incision is either sternotomy or this clamshell, like you opening your car tool. It's a mo most of cases, and we use sequential one lung ventilation. This is a, an important consideration we will discuss later. In these cases, mostly we use cardiac pulmonary bypass or the, or the VA, venous arterial ectomy. This is uh, the protocol from Ohio State at 2013 and updated till 2019. Uh, you will uh, find every single data you need in this page. If you are searching about the inclusion and exclusion criteria, you can read it from this slide, but I will go, go into the preparation of the group. This is uh, the OR at Ohio State. We can see the infusion or the uh, infusion preps. So this is the anesthesia machine, monitors. This is for electronic documentation, and this is our important CE and Tonkosko. Monitoring, we use the standard monitoring. Uh, we put two A lines, radial and femoral. This is very important, and we use it even in Egypt in the liver transplant because after reperfusion, radial artery gets dampened. So you uh, will push more and more visible pressure or any props. The femoral artery can give you a true or accurate insight about the hemodynamics. So in a very nice comparative study, it decreased the need for uh, vasopressors and inotropes. But monitor artery catheter, some uh, will go for uh, to say it's invasive. No, it's mandatory in lung transplant because not 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 only for sampling, it gives you like uh, continuous monitoring of the, as we can see here, the cardiac output and the cardiac index. Cerebral exometry and the uh, thromboelectrography. This is cerebral exometry. It's very important to direct even the red blood cell transfusion. The rule of TE. Trans GR echo is very important in lung transplant to assess the RV. All through the operation of the lung transplant, you should watch the RV. Um, also, it's important for assessment of the volume set, as you know, as in whole thoracic surgery. Uh, we uh, tend to, I will not say hypovolemic, but to aeovolemic or a little bit, a little bit hypovolemic to avoid the uh, pulmonary edema or excess lung uh, water. Uh, you can check the anastomosis of the pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein by the duplex, and you can uh, detect any complication like the air impulse, especially after connection of the pulmonary vein. Uh, some air in the LA and the LD, and this is uh, for sure uh, can cause uh, many complications up to coronary ischemia. Uh, this is a nice quote about the pulmonary venous flow, Doppler, yeah. What do you mean? After all this monitoring, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, emphasize on this near future, uh, this technology thought by Edward. It's introduced in Ohio State University just this year. It's called HPI, or High Potential Prediction Index. High Potential Prediction Index can tell you about the upcoming incidence of high potential episodes 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and five minutes uh, before the incident. So here, it's about 88 over 100. So after five minutes, it can it can tell uh, it tells you that uh, there is episode uh, or there will be an episode of hypotension. Not only this is what's called a secondary screen. 
uh, this um, marvelous or uh, awesome device tells you about every uh, step about the hemodynamics, cardiac output, system vascular systems. Uh, so it tells you what you should get, fluids, vasopressors, or any throat. So it's, uh, it, it carry the anesthetist from the phase of reactive, we react to, to the hypotension to the proactive stage. We can uh, we can predict the hypotension and we can manage before this incident. So it's a more or less a fresh technology. Uh, this is the drip. Uh, as we can see, everything is uh, controlled uh, is through controlled infusion, and it, it comes in a pre-made uh, way. Um, that is the antibiotic uh, protocol. Uh, this is uh, for sure melironone should be ready for the sake of the RB. As we said, you should watch the RB. If you watch your RB, you will save your back for sure. Uh, this is the another drip. Yeah. This is a very important, the inhaler apoprostenol. It's a, it's a prostaglandin for the pulmonary, uh, uh, work, works as a pulmonary vasodilator. As we can see here, this is the pre meat syringe containing about one milligram apoprostenol, and we put it in this inhaler connected to the inspiratory limb. This is a routine daily, uh, or this is a daily routine in the lung transplant that we put the inhaler apoprostenol. Induction of anesthesia. Induction is a very crucial part of this surgery. So please uh, make your surgeon and perfusionist ready in the room. Why it's a crucial part? Because uh, all what we get will decrease the cardiac output and uh, to some extent will increase the pulmonary vascular system. As we can see, suppression of sympathetic, uh, sympathetic system, vasodilatation, and all these postulated mechanisms will decrease the cardiac output. Number two, uh, increasing the pulmonary vascular systems, which will affect the RV again. If there, uh, there was like light anesthesia, all of this hydroxic hydrocarbic and acidosis will increase the pulmonary vascular systems and cause RV dysfunction. Induction agent uh, during sedation, please uh, make sure that your patient is not hypopenulated. Uh, they don't use uh, tomidate, uh, they use propofol as usual. About the cranium, uh, you make sure uh, that um, you give more uh, and more to about 1.5 milligrams the QG to avoid the aspiration because, as we said, it's about timing. When you pick uh, an organ, it's about 26 hours. You will call the recipient. If he is not uh, fasting, you will not postpone the surgery. So there is a risk of aspiration for sure. The uh, purely about the volatile anesthetics that uh, please don't uh, go beyond uh, one mac of any volatile anesthetics because it will attenuate what's called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is the good physiology. What will save you during the surgery is the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So please maintain it. And we will discuss about it uh, about after about five to six slides. Induction is crucial. So uh, let's see this uh, nice case report. It's a real case report from Ohio State. It happened, I think, 2014. Uh, our patient is 48 year old female patient, COPD and the smoker. This is the pre transplant workup. Uh, sorry, I didn't mention the abbreviation, but this is the pulmonary function test. It's long perfusion quantification, right? And the hard characterization. This is the ABG. All of this are accepted, except for sure he is a little bit hypoxic. The most important is the CT chart. This patient is so a smoker, so uh, there is a little bit of his impetus fully, as we can see here. Other investigations uh, were normal. At the OR, after induction of anesthesia, uh, I think this is a good chance to see what uh, practically uh, occurs at lung transplant. On I state, we put endotracheal tube. Why in the tube uh, first for the W tube to uh, to make bronchoscopy? Why uh, we make bronchoscopy first to uh, it's like surgical preference to check the bronchial tree, do a little bit suction. Then after uh, doing the bronchoscopy and for sure for research any research study, we replace it with W uh, tube over for sure exchange catheter. Means when I see the started, then they put their vascular axis. We said that you need you need center venous line and you need sangans or terminary arterial catheter. 
this is Mac introducer is a very versatile uh, device. It's called multi lumen access catcher. You uh, 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 instead of doing two punctures, one for center venous line, one for the pulmonary arterial catheter, you uh, will do only one punction, and you can insert the pulmonary spine guns or pulmonary arterial catheter through this port. So there is you have two ports for the center venous line, and you have this pulmonary spine guns through the middle port. So it's only one puncture, one bullet, and you get all the start. At the OR, after intubation, heart rate increased to about 140 and 150. For sure, most of us will say, yeah, the patient is a little bit conscious, I will, get, uh, I will increase the depth of anesthesia. But uh, please uh, respect uh, the hemodynamics. Tachycardia may be uh, more dangerous than the bradycardia. Bradycardia telling you the heart is slowing, but tachycardia may say, um, may uh, mean uh, uh, further complications. After tachycardia uh, increase, they, I think, increase the depth of anesthesia. Uh, they put the pulmonary arterial catheter. And after about, you can see here, about 30 minutes, the pulmonary arterial pressure increased. Then 10 minutes, the blood pressure decreased to 60 over 40. There is a frank shift. They push norepinephrine, epinephrine, vasopressin, the uh, vasopressin, the blood pressure improved but still low. Thanks to Allah, they made a surgical skin incision. Just after opening the left chest, this patient was uh, for la, uh, left lung transplant. After opening the left chest, the blood pressure rebounded to 200, and one, uh, 200 over 100 meter mercury. So uh, I think this was too much uh, info. So what happened? This is uh, the electronic sheet. I think this is. Yeah, this is a very nice photo. You can see this is the A line. A line reach here is about 80. Yeah, you can see it's here right now. This is 100. So the A line is 80 over 50. Then after left chest open, it increased or rebounds to 200 over 100. So the, uh, this is very important to uh, us as an anesthetist is that there is something you can fix. But another thing, the surgeon shot fix. So what happened? This is the list of the differential diagnosis, but uh, I think 80 to 90% of us uh, figured out that it was tension pneumothorax. Why tension pneumothorax? Because this is the exaplanted lung. As we can see here, this is an infusimitous poly, meaning infusimitous poly, one of them ruptured. So there is tension pneumothorax. After opening the chest, you converted it from tension pneumothorax to open uh, pneumothorax and the puncture uh, back to normal or a little bit hypertense. This patient was saved, excavated after one day and discharged to his home or to her home after 20 days. A good clinical tip here is about the transesophageal echo. No one knows about the pneumothorax because of uh, no one knows uh, about pneumothorax except after opening the chest and the sea and watching all this infusimitous poly. So, does echo help or did echo help in single lung transplant in such a hemodynamic and stable or life threatening situation? I doubt it. Why? Because you know it's left sided lung transplant, so it's left up lateral position. So your heart is not that straight one, it's a mal rotated. Add the pneumothorax. This is a very nice photo. This is the mass effect of the pneumothorax. So you have a mal rotated heart with, compressed with the pneumothorax. Please tell me about the image acquisition. I think it's very difficult. So the report of the TE showed that LED is poorly visualized, RV is also poorly visualized. So TE doesn't help or didn't help in this such. Uh, yeah, this is a nice algorithm about the uh, diagnosis uh, of pneumothorax by, uh, by ultrasound. Uh, we can read it later. The airway management. All, <laughs> every anesthetist expected that, but the reality <laughs> is about that. It's our bad luck. Uh, this is a very nice uh, quote, uh, uh, said, uh, the hard work puts you where the good luck can find you. So 
uh, it's a very important issue uh, in the lung transplant is the airway management. We for sure talk about lung isolation. We use the fiber optic bronchoscopy or the prompt for confirmation of the position of either double lung tube, uh, double alumen uh, tube, or bronchial blocker, a little bit suction, and to uh, check the bronchial and smooth. This is, I was very lucky to get this this photo. This is, as we can see, this is the balloon of the double human tube. And this, I think it was double human or the east blocker. And this is the stitches at the bronchial. So you can check the anastomosis well. Lung isolation. Uh, double human tube, uh, I will not discuss it, but uh, briefly, if you put a double human tube here and you, uh, and through that tracheal port, you push uh, your or introduce your fiber optic. If you are at the carina, you will get this photo. A balloon here and the other uh, bronchus is here. If you uh, introduce, introduce it a little bit in the right bronchus, you will see the Mercedes pins side. Uh, why we use the left tube? For sure, to avoid the early takeoff of the right bronchus. You can imagine this pilot balloon will be inflated right here. So you will get a right upper loop plus post operative. If you put the bronchoscope, in the uh, bronchial uh, port and you are here right now you will see only two holes upper and lower for the left lung for sure is upper and consists of upper and lower glue uh yeah i will talk about tube exchanger it's a very important way if you put double human tube please when you uh exchange it if you, when you exchange it with single human tube at the end of surgery please use the tube exchanger it's you know safety comes first yeah, uh, one of the most recent devices used uh, for lung isolation is the bronchial blocker. This is called ease blocker. As as we can see, it's very easy. Just uh, put the uh, uh, the blocker uh, at the carina level. Then you inflate the right if you want to block the uh, right lung, or inflate the left if you want to block the left lung. So it's called ease blocker. Now, what's our protocol in our Ohio, in Ohio State University? We put into tracheal tube, no more double human tube. We put into tracheal tube, or, or, but with a wider diameter, maybe eight to nine. Uh, so uh, there, uh, there is a room for both the fiber optic and the double human. So we need uh, for the fiber optic and the uh, bronchial broker. So we need a wide for uh, into tracheal tube. And this is the protocol which is set up right now. Which is better, double human or pranker blocker? Pranker blocker may uh, take a longer duration. For sure, it's, uh, there is no longer duration with the is blocker. But uh, this is uh, this randomized control study say that pranker blocker has less uh, post of the forceness of voice, and this is uh, a good issue to consider for sure. Uh, this is a very nice uh, book. Uh, I read it on Amazon about the management. How we can win forever. The interoperative management. We will talk about the ventilation strategy, hypoxia, the hemodynamic support, breathing, and reperfusion. About the ventilation strategy, I said uh, we uh, use what's called one lung ventilation either in single lung transplant or sequential lung ventilation in the, the double lung transplant. In the single lung transplant, the physiology is very awesome. So why? Because it's a lateral decubitus. So the dependent lung is done, it's not the operative lung. The dependent lung, by gravity, it's well perfused. By your uh, ventilatory management, it's well ventilated. The best matching. The upper or the non-dependent lung it's the operative. It's in the operative lung. Uh, the surgical manipulation will decrease the blood flow. The gravity will decrease the blood flow. It's not uh, ventilated, so more or less uh, less perfused, less ventilated. This is a good matching. Who will save you is the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And when there is a little bit hypoxia, the blood is diverted away from the non-ventilated uh, areas. So this will improve the matching. But this is not good all through why because as the double lung transplant you know you ventilate here the surgeon will transplant here uh, then the surgeon will go here to transplant and you will uh, ventilate the new lung the problem here is the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction has two stages 
acute stage and delayed stage. Delayed stage up to hours. So let's imagine this uh, this lung is the new lung. There was hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which is still ongoing. You will ventilate now this lung. This lung is less perfused. You will ventilate better a less perfused lung. This is called VQ mismatching. So you should uh, predict a little bit hypoxia because of the delayed hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction in case of sequential one lung ventilation at the double lung transplant. How they uh, avoid all of this? By cardiac pulmonary bypass or VA ECMO, so no more uh, either uh, uh, um, hypoxia or or nothing else. Which pressure control or volume control? There is uh, no, uh, it's not big deal. There is no big difference between both of them. Please uh, keep the rest FI2 to mean saturation more than 90 percent, P5 and more. Tidal volume uh, four to six mL per kg. This is like uh, the lung protective strategy. IE ratio from one to two to uh, make uh, a room for the air to get out. You know, we should uh, avoid dynamic hyperinflation. And the respiratory rate, you should follow the hypercapnia to avoid increased pulmonary vascular resistance, which will affect the RV and cause RV dysfunction. This is about ventilation before the transplant. If you got hypoxia, what you will do? You have now ventilated lung and non-ventilated lung. If you have, a, 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 as regard the ventilated lung, please do prong. Maybe uh, there is a little bit uh, secretions, a little bit blood, you can uh, get it out. So uh, the hypoxia will be improved, increase the FI2, increase PEEP, do some recruitment. A non-ventilated lung, but I think it's technically difficult, we can use this, you know, this bag, I, I hope it's here. It's, uh, we connected it, as we can see in this photo. This is the ventilated lung, this is a non-ventilated lung. I will put it here. It's a, a pressure from one to 10, not more. You can make life pressure support ventilation for the non-ventilated lung, uh, but it's for sure taking a difference in single lung transplant. And you can make some recruitment for this non-ventilated lung. After increasing FI2, increasing PEEP, do prompt, there is still hypoxia. What is the other solution? First, you can get ICU ventilator. There is a, a live food from Ohio State. Uh, this patient uh, suffers from hypoxia. So we get the ICU ventilator because it can offer you more and more moods, which may improve the hypoxia. Still hypoxic, go for VV ECMO. Still hypoxic, you can ask the, the surgeon for of the pulmonary for the, for the transplanted uh, for the native lung which you uh, which the surgeon is going to transplant it uh, the, the same physiology decrease perfusion decrease ventilation you will improve the matching between ventilation and perfusion ECMO is not uh, ECMO doesn't mean end of hypoxia is there hypoxia after VV ECMO yes if there is hypoxia, please uh, uh, please check the canal position by the TE. Uh, I think this photo is a nice one. We can just zoom in. Yes, this is the bicapal view. This is the cannula of the VV echo through the SVC. So you can see its position uh, clearly. Uh, if the position is good, ask the professional to check the ECMO. ECMO is like ventilation, it's like the ventilator. You can ask him to increase the FI. The most important slide is about the hemodynamic support. Always watch the RV. How you diagnose the RV dysfunction? By using the transit GI echo. You can see if it's dilated, you know, this is the normal between the LV and the RV. If it's hypokinetic, you can go for the swan gans to tell you about the pulmonary artery pressure, the intravenous pressure. All of this will tell you about the RV dysfunction. How you how how could you manage the RV dysfunction by decrease the preload, decrease the afterload, enhance the contractility? Uh, suicide RV is a very uh, nice term. Uh, that the RV uh, there is some sort of increasing afterload, and then you push forward, you push forward, so the RV will be stuck between increased preload and increased afterload. So please decrease this load 
decrease the after load by evoprostonal inhaler we talk about it or inhalation of nitric oxide of if evoprostonal uh, evoprostonal is not available you can enhance the contractility by milirinone epinephrine pharmacology of PA ECMO so VA ECMO or CARTS pulmonary bypass for lung transplant which is better they uh, in this uh, nice study uh, at Toronto they found that ECMO is associated with less blood transfusion less ice use uh, length of stay less time or uh, on ventilator daily so it, it looks better than papers ECMO doesn't mean no problem this is a very nice photo from Ohio State for this case you know he is the same case who suffers from hypoxia. If you remember, they said the ice open later. I can, I just want to show, yeah. I hope it's clear. This is, uh, you can see this is facial cyanosis. The face of the patient get blue after cannulation of the ECMO. You should inform the surgeon to check the cannula. This is called SVC syndrome or severe vena cava syndrome because of the malposition of the cannula, which is in the SVC, as you can see here, and the VB ECMO. This is a cannula from here, and this cannula go uh, to SVC. So if this cannula is malpositioned, it will obstruct the flow from the face and it cause facial congestion. This is the photo again. Pleading. Bleeding is not a big issue at a lung transplant, but to manage it, you can you should uh, consider the thromboelastography. Uh, it can tell you uh, which uh, what your patient need: uh, cryo, precipitate, fresh frozen plasma, if, or any uh, one of the coagulation factor. You should use a cell saver to save the blood, and this is a very nice device called the rapid infuser. Rapid infuser collects the blood from cell saver from the crystalloids you give to your patient from the blood products and they push it into the patient's circulation with a very nice rate, 500 up to 750 ml per minute. You can push half liter of blood fluid to the patient in only one minute. But for sure, in thoracic surgery, we are not uh, using uh, uh, this rapid infuser. The reperfusion, as we can see when the blood uh, came back uh, or comes back to the lung, is a very critical time before the clamping of the pulmonary artery we give heparin after the clamping we give methyl prednisolone this reperfusion is the same as ischemia causing lung injury on the multi or multi-organ dysfunction this is the postulated mechanism of the ischemic reperfusion injury what the rule of anti test at reperfusion you should do three steps first go for the te to uh, check the B airing or more air embolism because the air embolism can cause coronary ischemia. You will find your RV not functioning well because of a little bit air embolus here or there. If the RV uh, is hypokinesia from the coronary ischemia and you can check the anastomosis of the pulmonary vein or the pulmonary artery. Do uh, prong for suction for check anastomosis as we said. And now, what about the ventilation of the transplanted lung, the new lung? You should use low FI2, make some recruitment, and they talk about the differential ventilation, especially in single lung transplant. Why? Now you have a native lung, which is uh, not good, and in transplanted lung, which uh, should be very good. You can't, you know, one size doesn't fit all. You can't push the ventilator set uh, for both lung with the same. So you can make what's called depression ventilation between the transplant lung, which uh, assumed it to be good, and the native lung, which is for sure uh, not good. Ventilation of the new lung, in this study, they used pressure control more than volume control. They used tidal volume of 6 ml per kg for sure of the recipient, not for the donor. So the new transplant, the, the transplanted lung, you will ventilate it with tidal volume of 6 ml per kg of the recipient, not the donor predicted by the way, limiting the FI2, P5 and up, and maintain the plateau pressure not more than 30 as the lung protective structure.
extubation uh, single lung transplant i think right now uh, you know this study was very old about 2003 and they talk about early extubation after single lung transplant uh, early extubation means in extubation inside the or till about three to six hours after the operation uh, i think it's improved at 2020 and this reflects the improvement of the learning curve so a uh, single lung transplant could be exhibited inside the OR. My own experience, it's only one case. <laughs> Transport, uh, transportation is a very critical time, and this is a very important about the double human tube. I was uh, lucky to attend a very dramatic case. At the end of, uh, of an operation, it was robotic uh, cabbage uh, or minimal invasive mitre or something like that. But uh, uh, the idea is that we put double limb tube. Now we will transport the patient. The protocol say that please change or replace the double limb tube with a single limb tube through a tube exchange catheter. The consultant said it's the easy incubation. I will make the resident to put the tube without the tube exchange capture. He put it esophageal and the patient developed a cardiac arrest. A hypoxic cardiac, it's not cardiac arrest, but it developed hypoxia up to slowing of the heart rate. So please, there is no flexing here. Double unit tube replace it with tube exchange capture. You know, it was at the end of the surgery. Surgeon is happy, uh, and if it is happy, everyone is happy, and this traumatic end was very awful for sure. During transportation, you should be fully equipped and the reversal of master relaxant agent is of utmost importance. I uh, faced a patient, uh, it was like, uh, it was, um, with a surgery of uh, replaced aorta. They replaced the aorta from the arch of aorta till the iliac uh, bifurcation. Uh, they didn't reverse the uh, muscle relaxant and the patient uh, suffered from delayed recovery at the OR and everyone thinks that, oh, there is a spinal cord ischemia, but after reverse of muscle relaxant, the patient get conscious and the, uh, everyone was happy. Finally, the research agenda, what, you, uh, what, you, uh, uh, what are the fields of study in the, uh, lung, in the uh, lung transplant? For sure, the exit is lung perfusion because, it, as we said, it expands the pool of the lung. Uh, so more and more lung available, so you can do the double lung transplant. Because simply, you uh, as a single lung transplant, you put one lung. The other lung will, uh, will cause what's called acute hyperinflated native lung. It's where it's uh, it's hyperinflated, mostly in symptoms, and it will compress this new young small lung. Bioengineered lungs, I think the, nowadays there is bioengineered kidney, so we are uh, hoping or we are looking forward to bioengineered lung, and for sure it's all about the genetics. Our home message is that please, uh, the COVID pandemic, protect yourself and stay safe. Uh, finally, this is our, this is the last uh, slide. This is, uh, this is a very nice uh, about in ancient Egypt. Here you can see uh, Nefertiti, one of our most beautiful uh, queens, give his uh, husband, give her husband a plant. They said it's about opium to cure him from uh, an emergency pain. I hope uh, Dr. Dominique is still here and said that. Thank you, uh, our audience, and uh, I, I apologize. I apologize for this uh, long uh, lecture. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Islam. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, well. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Dr. Islam, for the excellent presentation and thorough presentation. Um, so I've got so I've got two questions for you. So one question is asking about is there is any role for pulmonary artery catheter in the presence of uh, transesophageal echo? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you are expert in transgenic echo, you will uh, know that to detect a cardiac output, you should have two readings. You can imagine now the patient, the blood pressure is low, and you should go for the aorta, then go for the R2, uh, for the L2 to detect the cardiac output. So, uh, Swangan give you a continuous monitoring of the cardiac output, not only cardiac output, the same vascular the cardiac index. So, please, please uh, stop saying it's invasive. It's a very, uh, you know, uh, during the multi-axis human catheter, it's a very easy. 
uh, for sure there is some complications. I can't forget the day when the surgeon stitch the, the balloon of the pulmonary <laughs> swan glands. It's, it's for sure, you know, complications happen. But for sure, continuous monitoring is very, very important. You can see in the case report that the patient is about to be crashed after induction of anesthesia. So it's very important because it's continuous. If the TE would give me continuous monitoring of the cardiac of both cardiac index, uh, I will say uh, chapeau for the TE. I've got another question. Uh, would you please mention the post-operative pain management? Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, it's, it's my question for the audience about the peripheral nerve block for the uh, clamshell incision. You know, I, I searched for it many times and uh, some talk about uh, quadris numborum, it's not effect, some talk about many things, but you know, it's a very difficult because it's a transferred incision. You know, uh, epidural carry for sure the rest of uh, neuroaxial hematoma, especially with all this heparin we get. So in uh, Ohio State University, the protocol was only intravenous, uh, intravenous opioids, especially for the age. Okay, I got another so question. The yeah, my, my answer is yeah. uh, Sorry. The intravenous opioids. So intravenous only, you don't do a paravertebral block or anything? Uh, or, you know, um, by the surgeons. I, I, I asked about that, but they said it's, it's a preference to avoid uh, any neuroaxial uh, blocking or neuroaxial uh, analgesia in this case. Okay, and. Uh, Another question, how can anesthetic, uh, what is your anesthetic maintenance during transplant? Um, in the case report, uh, uh, it was sevoflurane. They use sevoflurane as usual. Uh, some, some talks about, yeah, this is a very good question. Some talks about TIVA, total intravenous anesthesia, to avoid, you know, they, they talk about TIVA only to avoid increasing the MAC of volatile anesthesia to maintain the hypoxic constriction. I said that if you go beyond one MAC, you will attenuate the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction due to the vasodilatory effect of volatile anesthetic. But till now, as general antispinal, TIVA, there is no, there is no uh, privilege for TIVA over the volatile anesthetic. So they use volatile anesthetics and more or less there is propofol infusion to decrease the uh, concentration of the volatile anesthetic. So the maintenance, volatile plus or minus propofol infusion. And another question, uh, uh, how much time- I have all this question, the sure. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> how much time is required uh, uh, to take over the spontaneous ventilation of neurotransplanted lungs? Yeah, uh, he, he mean that or what? Uh, I think how much time required uh, to leave the patient to spontaneously ventilate in the newly transplanted lung? No, it's it's not. Uh, there is no or... ventilation. I, I, I think he, he, he means that. I think when... it's operative. I think I'm not sure. No, I, I can't understand. Oh, uh, I think I think he mean uh, when can you extubate your patient? Yeah, we, we talk about if it's double lung transplant, it's a different story for sure. Uh, during my business scholarship at Ohio State University, there, is, there was a research about the about uh, the microbes at the newly transplanted lung, so they maintain the patient ventilated till the next day to take mm -hmm. a specimen or sample from uh, the OR, then mm -hmm. 24 hours. Mm -hmm. But single lung transplant, which wasn't in this research study, the, like like any open heart surgery during the first six hours, because uh, and the, uh, I said that I attended one case admitted in the OR. Mm -hmm. okay. So and six hours. Another, another question asking about the immunosuppression plan uh, used Methyl after lung transplant. Yeah, in the protocol. Uh, you know, uh, for the sake of time, because Dr. Saad was insisting that I will not uh, no, take your time, take your time. for two minutes. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, they give methyl prednisolone only uh, after declamping, as I said, about 500 milligram uh, uh, to be five to six milligram the PG. Uh, the another uh, immunosuppressive, the protocol in Ohio, that they will not occupy the anesthetist with all these drugs. The immunosuppressive 
uh, ha uh, has been given to the patient before uh, entry to, to the OR. So you will only get heparin before the clamp and the methyprednisone after the clamp. Dr. Islam, do you give uh, any thiobentone on, uh, on bypass? Thiobentone? Uh, you know, the perfusionist is responsible about that, but no, I didn't see a thiopin cell in uh, either in Cyprus. I, 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 I can't remember, but it is not in, uh, in the protocol. Islam, uh, if you don't mind, I have uh, questions. I'm not expert as you in uh, thoracic anesthesia, but uh, you mentioned at the end of the operation, you uh, changed the tube from double lumen tube uh, through exchanger and some event happens uh, if uh, the junior yeah. staff is dealing with this. Uh, uh, why not from the start we are using, uh, for example, Univent tube. And Univent tube, can, you can take it out the uh, blocker and you can send as uh, uh, not a double lumen, uh, only one yeah. lumen tube. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do what, what, what you mentioned. Now it's a single lumen tube. A single lemon, but it's a little bit wider. I mean, eight to nine uh, millimeter of the internal diameter to go to put the fiber optic to go uh, to put uh, the bronch uh, the bronchial blocker. So we did what you mentioned, sir, right now. But I mentioned a case in it they need double lemon tube. But the yes. protocol now, especially after is blocker, you know, is blocker is very easy. You just hook it. I know. Then, yeah. Thank you. No, I mean, Univent tube, it contains itself simultaneous with the yeah. blocker. Univent, not yeah, yeah. The, 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 the usual yeah, tube, yeah. and yeah. you insert the is blocker. The Univent yeah. tube, it contains already the yeah. blocker. You yeah, can yeah. take it out, and you can use as one lumen tube. Is there a room for the bronchoscopy? Is there yes. a room in this sure. room for bronchoscopy? Sure. Oh, I, think, I think it should work. It should work. Yes. Should yes. Work. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, more questions to read, Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Saad, are we fine with the time? or uh, We're fine with the time. One more question, because we have a, an important announcement by uh, Prof. Hassan Manna uh, for the next session. Okay. So one of the questions was about the post-operative IV analgesia. What is the drug of choice that you normally use? Uh, you know, in... Uh, in Ohio State, they use, um, I think codeine is not uh, available in Egypt, so you can give nalpicrine, uh, you get intravenous uh, fentanyl. I think uh, there is no big uh, deal here. You will get what you are experiencing there. So they get oral codeine over there? No, mm -hmm. no maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not like morphine PCA or something like that, or fentanyl PCA. Maybe fentanyl. This is Maybe fentanyl till he gets conscious. Uh, so uh, then I think there is no more fentanyl except there's just some policies if he uh, feels some pain. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Saad. Thank you, Dr. Saad. Uh, we actually uh, got to a conclusion of this session.